Well, on behalf of both DNA Genotech and Metabolon, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar program today. I think I speak for both groups when I say we're extremely excited about the information and innovation that our speakers will be sharing today. My name is Kenny Anderson, Director of Strategic Marketing at Metabolon. I'll be your host and moderator for today's event entitled Metabolomics and the Microbiome Revolution, Critical Innovations to Unlock Gut Microbial Function in Human Health. Now, before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to provide some instruction on how to pose any questions you have for our speakers. So the presentation has been muted for all attendees, but we do encourage questions. We ask that they be submitted through the Q&A window, and you can find that located at the bottom of your screen, and those will be answered during the question and answer session at the end. I should also mention that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with you in follow-up correspondence. So let's introduce our speakers for today. They are Dr. Lisa Frankman, staff scientist at Metabolon, Dr. Heloise Breton, product manager, microbiome at DNA Genotech, Dr. Suchitra Hurigan, vice chair of research at Innova Children's Hospital, and Dr. Tom Schmidt, professor, University of Michigan. And with that, Dr. Franklin, the presenter role is yours, so please take it away. Hello, and uh, welcome to the webinar. I'm so excited to introduce today's topic, metabolomics and the microbiome revolution. Um, this audience probably needs no convincing that the microbiome is a key frontier in today's healthcare research. The microbes that live both within and on our bodies have been implicated in a host of biological functions, with health impacts ranging from cosmetics to immuno-oncology to everything in between. Many of these insights have come from uh, a robust government-sponsored uh, research program totaling almost a billion dollars annually from the NIH. Uh, and venture capital has also played a significant role with over a billion dollars invested in microbiome-based healthcare startups to date. Now this general overview relates to microbiome research as a whole, but what's been increasingly appreciated in recent years is the key importance of metabolites or small molecule biochemicals um, as signals in host microbe communication. And on this slide, I've just pulled out a very, very small summary of some key metabolites that have recently been implicated in human disease conditions. Now, it would be great and really convenient if we could obtain this information from metagenomic sequencing, because as I'm sure we all appreciate, uh, metagenomic sequencing is a really robust and widely applied methodology. But this figure from the Human Microbiome Project shows that unfortunately, it does not tell us the full story. So each column um, on this graph is a single individual whose microbiome was sampled at a variety of body sites. And the top set of plots represents the phylogenetic diversity based on metagenomic sequencing of those different microbiomes. And you can see that there's quite a wide range of diversity. And yet, when these researchers attempted to reconstruct metabolic pathways on the basis of that metagenomic sequencing information, that it revealed a surprising degree of homogeneity across subjects and even across body sites. So how is this possible when I've just told you that metabolites are critically important and can even differentiate healthy subjects from, uh, from disease? Well, a big part of it is that um, not all metabolic genes in the metagenomes of organisms in our microbiome have been characterized. In fact, a large number still remain unannotated. For those genes that can be assigned to a metabolic function based on sequence homology, as was done here, we know that a small change in sequence can lead to big and often unpredictable changes in what that gene actually does metabolically. And finally, and I think most importantly, merely the presence of a sequence within a metagenome does not mean that that metabolic enzyme will be expressed, nor that it will be active, since that requires the presence of its substrates and um, any cofactors as well. So uh, we really believe that metabolomics is necessary to complete the picture by providing an integrative readout of phenotype, since it accounts not only for um, the metagenomic composition of the microbiome, but also the effect of the host genome, the availability of substrate from the diet and other environmental exposures, as well as, importantly, the metabolic interactions among, among the microbiomes, the microbes themselves. Uh, for this reason, we believe that metabolomics has already had and will continue to increasingly have a really big impact on health research from 
basic understanding of disease mechanism all the way through the clinical translation. And our two guest speakers today will delve into some of the applications of metabolomics in their own microbiome research. But first, I'd like to direct our attention to a specific technological challenge that's facing this area right now. Um, as we've already seen, metagenomic sequencing of feces has been really widely used, and it's stimulated a lot of interest in overlaying that genetic information with matched metabolomic data from the same feces samples. But so, so far, the logistics of fecal sample collection has limited and constrained the um, possibilities of this type of research. The reason is that many metabolites are unstable, and therefore flash freezing is the gold standard for preservation of just about any type of sample for metabolomics. And this is especially true, of course, for feces, where um, metabolic activity will continue um, even after the sample uh, has left the patient's body. Um, when you consider the prospect of flash freezing of human feces, however, uh, this is clearly not very practical in a wide range of study designs. And in fact, donors would much prefer to collect sample at home. Um, unfortunately, up until recently, the collection methodologies that were available for at-home collection of feces were not suitable for metabolomics. These, in, these were optimized for other uses, such as DNA stabilization or immunochemical testing, and therefore they contain salts, detergents, and other reagents that interfere with instrument signals uh, from liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, which is commonly used for metabolomics. And some reagents like formalin actually directly destroy metabolites. The upshot is a loss of sensitivity and accuracy of metabolomic analysis and a distortion of the metabolomic profile of fresh sample. And this has been well attested both by our internal R&D here at Metabolon and in literature. So that leads me to our next speaker, Dr. Eloise Breton, um, who will introduce OmniMedGut. OmniMedGut is the first sample collection solution that has been optimized and developed specifically for at-home collection and ambient temperature sp stabilization of human feces samples specifically for metabolomics. Um, after Dr. Breton's presentation, I'll take back over and go into detail on some of the validation work that we performed um, to verify and confirm the performance of OmniMedGut. And afterward, our two guest presenters, Dr. Hurrigan and Dr. Schmidt, uh, will describe some of the applications of metabolomics in general and OmniMedGut in particular in their own microbiome research. I'm so excited to get started, and Heloise, take it away. Uh, I'm very pleased to be representing the DNA Genotech team today. Uh, and as you mentioned, I will be talking about our newly released product, which is the OmniMet Gut device, which is the first and only all-in-one system for easy at-home collection of fecal samples for the purpose of metabolomics. Uh, just to situate DNA Genotech in this landscape a little bit more, we are collection uh, specialists. That's what we do day in, day out. And we are part of the molecular business unit at Forisher Technology. Um, we specialize in the stabilization of nucleic acids, and we've been active in that space for many, many years now. Uh, we started out in the human genomic space, where we are very well known for our origin line of products, which allows you to stabilize samples uh, from saliva at ambient temperature. And our expertise in the stabilization of nucleic acid actually translated very well into the microbiome space. And there we were able to develop a whole portfolio of products that are dedicated to the stabilization of samples for microbiome purposes. And that is our OmniGene line of products. Uh, the most popular product out of that line is by far our OmniGene gut device, which is intended for the collection of fecal samples for the purpose of microbiome sequencing. Now, when that product hit the market a few years back, um, it was, there was great uptake. When one of the first questions that we got from our users shortly after was, what else can I do with my fecal samples? I want to get as much information as I can out of them. And when we listened to their request, metabolites was probably the top request we were receiving. Now, the OmniGene gut device is very well designed to stabilize DNA, but it doesn't fare too well to stabilize metabolites. And so we had to look at this new challenge and determine whether it was something that we thought we were able to take on. Now, as you've already mentioned, Lisa, um, the, the current gold standard in uh, the space of fecal metabolomics is um, flash freezing. And that is very problematic because when you want people to be collecting their samples at home, uh, that's very limiting and all of a sudden you have to very much depend on a cold chain transportation. And as, you, as you've already mentioned, there are many problems with the uh, existing collection methods, and I've just highlighted a few additional here, which we see when, we, when people are relying on cold chains. Uh, those include the fact that you have to use uh, increased shipping supplies to 
to get your samples from point A to point C. This can greatly increase your shipping costs and limit the number of samples you're actually able to acquire. Although we'd like to think that cold chain methods are quite reliable, we know from experience that samples tend to still undergo significant uh, temperature changes during transport, which can have an impact on your data. Using or relying on cold chain methods can also greatly limit the pool of donors you can typically reach because you have to work within a, a geography that actually allows you to get your samples in-house in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And we know from experience that um, the more cumbersome or the more invasive your collection method is, um, the lower compliance you're going to see from your donors. They just don't in, in enjoy taking their samples, which leads to high dropout rates and can greatly increase the power, uh, decrease the power of your study if you're not able to get your hands on all the samples that you wish you could. One other thing that was interesting for us to note in, in this space was that although there were existing methods for collecting feces, none of them were well adapted to feces themselves. And from our experience in the development of our OmniGene gut device for microbiome, we know that fecal samples are actually a very difficult matrix to work with, and they require considerable additional considerations to make sure that your methodology works well. And so with that expertise, we were excited to take on the challenge of coming up with a device that would work for fecal microbiome uh, metabolomics. Um, so what we did then was turn to the community and basically ask them for their wish list for everything that they would like to see in a device that could enable them to do fecal metabolomics. And with that wish list, we create a list of requirements for this new product that we wanted to put out, which ended up being the OmniMet Gut. Um, and most of these requirements can be bulked up into four major categories, which make up the pillars of any of the product development that happens at DNA Gantech. And these are the elements that I want to dig deeper on a little bit today. The first is user experience. Um, we know that you need to come up with a methodology that can be used by pretty much anyone that's going to be foolproof um, so that you can readily put it in everyone's hands and know that you can also scale up should you want to collect hundreds and hundreds of samples. Sample reproducibility is also extremely important to us and we like to consider that at every stage of the process. From the second we start manufacturing your tubes all, all the way to when they're used by your technicians in the lab, the samples have to be re reproducible at every step. Most important is probably data accuracy. We want to make sure that whatever product we're delivering to the community is going to give you the exact data that you would have obtained should you have gone with, for example, a, a gold standard method or if you had been able to process the sample immediately after it was produced. And last but definitely not least, sample stability. We have to give you that added logistical ease so that your research uh, is easier to undertake and so that you have that added flexibility in, flexibility in terms of how you're going to get your sample into the lab. So I'll start off with user experience. Uh, and if anybody on the web listening in today is familiar with the OmniGene gut product, you're probably thinking this OmniMet gut device looks strangely familiar and you wouldn't be wrong. Um, for the OmniMet gut device, we opted to use our already existing physical form factor that we had leveraged in our OmniGene device. The reason for this being was that we knew it was very well adapted to the collection of feces, but we also knew from a user experience point of view, it had been very well received. Um, there were years of development that went into this particular device, and we tested um, this uh, collection method with a variety of um, populations of naive donors, which included just your regular healthy donors, as well as elderly men, uh, mothers with newborns, as well as IBD patients, which was great because it allowed us to test out liquid stool. And what we observed was very high compliance when donors were presented with this uh, specific method of collecting samples. We saw great sample return rates, and the, we were able to demonstrate that the method is pretty foolproof. There were very few mistakes done by the donors, which led to extremely high rates of sample utilization when the samples hit the lab. Not only that, we did survey these populations that we were working with to uh, get their feeling on how the process was and what their, what their perception was, and the feedback was extremely positive. Most people thought the process was actually very easy, and some even said that they enjoyed it. And so we knew we had a winning form factor, and we didn't want to move away too much from it, because one of the things that we also foresee in this particular space is that anybody who's going to be planning on doing uh, fecal metabolomics will also be doing fecal microbiome uh, sequencing 
uh, side by side. And so we wanted those two tubes to complement one another. And so we did additional testing with a few more diet donors to see if you were asked to provide uh, samples in two of these tubes at the same time, how would that go? And the feedback was very positive. People mentioned to us that once you've produced a, a fecal sample and you're already going in there, and you're gonna go play around with it, whether you're at being asked to fill one tube or two tubes, it's pretty straightforward. And because our method was easy, they didn't mind doing it. So because we had a nice complementarity there, we were happy to work with this form factor. Just a little bit more on the form factor. Um, what's interesting about this particular tube is that it is made up of this yellow portion here, which acts as a volumetric chamber. And so what this does is actually controls how much sample the donors can actually put into the tube. So when collecting a sample, and donors are instructed to use the provided spatula to collect a pea-sized amount of feces, introduce it into the yellow portion, fill that up, and when they're done, they cap the tube and they uh, then agitate the tube to mix the fecal sample in with the stabilizer. Um, what this helps do first off is ensure that the fecal, um, the amount of fecal sample to uh, the amount of, of stabilizer, that ratio is pretty uh, consistent from donor to donor, since we know that only about half a gram of fecal sample was introduced. Not only that, because of the design where the ball bearing inside here helps mix the fecal sample in with the stabilizer, this ensures a really nice homogeneous um, sample to work with. And it also allows that stabilizer to go in and really do what it's supposed to do and get mixed into the feces and stop any uh, metabolic activity and stop any microbial activity to ensure that snapshot and that accuracy of the data. Um, so because we, we knew that this was also a design that increased reproducibility, we wanted to move forward with this uh, product design. Last but not least, I did want to mention uh, that an added level of reproducibility in using a product like OmniMet Gut is that you know that it's manufactured by us in our GNP certified facilities, uh, that it undergoes significant QA and QC, and that we will stand by our promise of quality. So if you're comparing this to potentially tubes that are produced, you know, in a lab by some uh, grad students, for example, you're not too sure that you're getting the same tube every time, but with us, you know that every tube that is being used in your study is identical to the next. And then we get into the real fun stuff, which is proving that our, our product will deliver the exact same data um, that you would have obtained if you had gone with the gold standard in, in this space. So what we did here with the support and collaboration of Metabolon is that we devised a study where we were able to compare how Omni Met Gut fares in comparison to samples when they are flash frozen. Um, and Lisa has more data on this, so I'm just going to quickly touch on it uh, very briefly. Uh, but one of the first things that we wanted to do right off the bat was demonstrate that if you are to use Omni Met Gut, you're going to get the same uh, number of metabolites out of your sample that you would have in flash frozen samples, and that the richness would be preserved. And as you see from this graphic here, uh, whether you collected an OmniMet gut, which is in pink, or if you had a flash frozen sample, you were getting the same number of metabolites out of your uh, sample, which is great confirmation that we were on the right track in terms of chemistry design. Then we also needed to demonstrate sample stability uh, for an extended period of time so that we were, as I mentioned, providing that additional logistical ease to donors to take their time, collect their sample at home, and then return it to the lab in a reasonable amount of time. And so for this study, what we did was we collected samples at baseline, and then we collected those same samples into OmniMet tubes and left them and stored them at a varying number of days, and we tested them to see if stability was maintained. What we were very happy to see was that even after seven days in OmniMet gut, your samples still look the same as they would have at baseline. And this graphic just quickly shows you that for each donor, so for example, this is one donor here, this is another here, for each donor, their samples cluster together, uh, whether or not they were uh, stabilized for seven days or if they were a baseline sample. So this gives us the confidence that the product will keep your sample stable at ambient temperature for at least a few days. So all that to say, um, there's lots more data out there that, but I can't share it all today. 
but we're very pleased to say that OmniMax Scott is the first collection kit on the market that offers ambient temperature stability and that has actually been validated for the purpose of completing metabolomic analyses. Um, thanks to our collaboration with Metabolon, who were the ones who helped us validate this device, we also know that the OmniMet gut technology integrates perfectly into Metabolon's platform, which gives our users added confidence uh, that they can work with these and get the very best data. Thank you. Thank you, Eloise, and that is a perfect segue into the rest of my presentation, which will delve more deeply into the validation of OmniMet Gut that we performed here at Metabolon in collaboration with DNA Genotech. Um, so what does it really mean to be validated by Metabolon? Um, as an ISO 9001 certified company, we have stringent requirements um, for any new process or product that we might introduce for both its performance and the integration of it into our customer service um, as a whole. Um, data quality, of course, is foundational. So when starting to work with OmniMed Gut, we needed to ensure that the data quality that our clients could receive from this new device could be compar comparable to that of the gold standard methodology, which, as we've already mentioned, is a media flash reading. Um, in particular, we uh, devoted a lot of time and attention to the sensitivity, uh, precision, and fidelity of samples that were collected and stored in these devices. And we also focused on the length of time that the samples could remain stable in OmniMed Gut and still give acceptable accuracy compared to um, the flash frozen methodology. In addition, however, we did not feel that we could recommend um, this product or consider it to be validated until it had also been tested in the field. And that's what we consider to be our biological validation. And our two guest speakers today will talk a little bit in a little bit more detail about those studies. Um, now, while, as I mentioned, data quality is foundational, it's not enough because um, in order to be able to stand by a product and recommend it, we need to make sure that it is fully integrated into our entire process. And to accomplish this required a great deal of coordination, um, documentation, and training throughout our company, starting with sales and sales operations, all the way to sample logistics, tracking inventory, of course, sample preparation and analysis, as well as data analysis and data delivery to our clients. Working with DNA Genotech, we integrated the validation data to prepare um, informational material for clients so that they would know exactly what to expect. And we also performed risk assessment uh, to basically break down the whole process and figure out exactly where things could go wrong so that we could address those risks before the launch happened. Now, uh, before I go into the validation data itself, I'd just like to take a step back and talk a little bit about what our Precision Metabolomics platform actually is so that you can understand better how OmniMega will fit in. Um, so our Metabolomics platform um, basically consists of several uh, discrete steps. It starts with specialized methods for collection and processing of a wide array of biological samples. So not only feces, not only blood, uh, but urine, cultured cells, fruit flies, microbes, sweat, skin tapes. I mean, if it's a biological sample, we've probably seen it in our sample prep lab. Um, once the samples are prepared, they go onto four parallel high throughput analytical methodologies that are based on liquid chromatography and tandem accurate mass spectrometry. Um, those raw data are matched to um, an, a spectral library of over 4,000 authentic standards, resulting in tier one metabolite identifications in the vast majority of cases. After stringent quality control, um, those data are then analyzed by statistical bioinformatic analysis, visualized and interpreted by our team of um, expert PhD biochemists. So over the last two years, a great deal of effort has been devoted to ensuring that OmniMetGut will fit seamlessly into this uh, workflow. Of course, the process will start with at-home collection of feces. That's the whole point of the device. But at that point, the sample will go into our logistics pipeline, which will be greatly facilitated by uh, the individual barcodes that are on every tube that work directly with our sample success kit and um, internal sample uh, inventory system. Uh, through our validation work in collaboration with DNA Genotech, we have developed and optimized a sample preparation procedure that is specific to these OmniMet gut tubes. And of course, due to our extensive history of working with both frozen and now OmniMet gut feces, our analysts are extremely comfortable and experienced with looking at and interpreting this type of data. So this is a great segue 
to uh, dive into some of the analytical validation studies that were actually performed. So I'll step through the three main study designs that we executed on. Uh, but before I do that, I'd just like to highlight the fact that in every case, the performance of OmniMed gut is being compared directly to matched um, gold standard samples, which are the flash frozen conditions. So our first experiment was an initial feasibility. And although that sounds rather small and simple, it actually was, it was rather large. It involved 14 individual donors whose samples were either flash frozen or starred in an OmniMed gut for up to two weeks. Um, and also a pool of 10 of those samples that was subjected to the same conditions with technical replicates of four. And the reason for this study design was that we wanted to um, assess both biological and technical variability and stability in a single study. We obtained really encouraging uh, initial results from this analysis, and I'll share some of those in a couple of slides. Um, so we then actually moved on to test four different versions of the stabilization chemistry within um, different versions of OmniMet gut to ensure that we could, um, with DNA genotypes, that we could obtain the best precision and stability for the sample. And finally, once DNA genotype was able to select the appropriate chemistry based on these results, uh, we performed a final validation uh, designed to both reproduce and expand upon the um, initial successes that we had seen. And this study was both a stability and a precision analysis uh, with 10 individual donors, again, comparing everything back to the gold standard of flash frozen condition. Um, so what did this actually look like? Uh, because of time constraints, I'm only able to show a small, um, some small highlights of the data. But if you'd like more, um, the white paper that um, goes into more of these results is now available at dnagenotech.com. Um, you, and if you go, uh, if you go and look up that white paper, you'll see um, our results showing that, as Heloise alluded to, the, the metabolite coverage of OmniMet gut stored feces is very similar to that of flash frozen samples, as is the precision. Now with stability, I'd like to go into a little bit more detail again, because this is so important to the purpose of this device. Um, to analyze stability, we looked at a couple of different metrics. Um, first, we compared the um, abundance of individual metabolites at different time points of OmniMet storage back to immediately frozen. And we found that approximately 85% of metabolites are within 25% of their um, initial levels after four days. And after seven days, that number is approximately 80%. Um, so that was very encouraging. We also did a, an overall correlation analysis where we took data from our seven donors um, at the flash, in the flash frozen condition, and then at each of the DNA, uh, at each of the OmniMet gut conditions. And we saw that the median Spearman correlation across all of the hundreds of biochemicals detected was approximately 0.86 at a one, four, and seven days of storage, um, which is a high degree of concordance between the two different collection methodologies. Um, another encouraging result came when we broke out the full list of over 900 biochemicals into biochemical classifications or super pathways. And we observed that the um, super pathways that contain most of the known bioactive microbial metabolites which is the amino acid and the xenobiotic super pathways, had a median correlation coefficient in the 0.85 to 0.9 range, depending on the time point. Again, representing a high degree of fidelity between the OmniMet gut samples and the flash frozen condition. So this might be a little bit numerical and abstract. So you might be wondering, what does this mean for my biological study? Well, an immediate clue to this came when we took the individual donor samples that we had um, analyzed and subjected them to hierarchical clustering analysis. This unsupervised technique groups more similar samples together. And what you can see by um, this plot is that the samples clustered by the donor identity, uh, which is pictured in the bottom color bar. Um, and the storage time and the storage condition, which are in the middle and top color bars, are uh, account for very little of the difference among the samples. What this means is that OmniMed gut accurately preserves the individual donor's unique metabolomic profiles. Another way to look at this was already presented by Heloise, but I'd just like to highlight the full data set from the third and final validation, uh, where we had the seven individual donors in replicates of three. And again, when we subjected them to principal component analysis, we could clearly see that an individual donor's samples cluster together, um, whereas the method of storage, whether flash frozen or OmniMed gut, and the time point of storage was relatively unimportant. 
Also, by looking at the technical replicate um, data points on this plot, we can actually qualitatively appreciate um, that there's no loss in precision, uh, there's no increase in process variability when looking at omnimed gut feces as compared to flash frozen. Um, I'd like to take a pause and um, step back from metabolomic data for a moment and give a brief overview of short-chain fatty acid validation. As many of you already know, short-chain fatty acids are a key group of bioactive metabolites produced from uh, metabolism of dietary fiber by specific gut microbes. They are volatile analytes, and as such, they require specialized assay conditions and are captured by most metabolomic methodologies. Fortunately, in our clinical and targeted assay group here at Metabolon, there was already an existing targeted assay for short-chain fatty acids from frozen feces, and our targeted assay group was able to adapt and fully revalidate that assay specifically for OmniMet gut samples. Um, that assay um, captures qu absolute quantitative data on eight short-chain fatty acids that are listed on the slide, and their validation included a number of quantitative metrics including linearity, accuracy, recovery, um, precision stability, and method equivalence to flash frozen. And this is just a small snippet of data through butyrate um, where you can clearly see that in any of the four um, OmniMet prototypes that we tested early on, uh, butyrate levels remain stable for many days over room, uh, at room temperature, whereas in an unstabilized sample that's merely left out at room temperature uh, without any stabilization, uh, ongoing microbial metabolism leads to a drastic increase in butyrate over time. We're also very pleased that both metabolomic and short-chain fatty acid analyses can be performed on the same OmniMet gut tube. So we really think this will enable um, a great deal of synergy um, and additional insight for researchers because they can take advantage of both methodologies from a single uh, patient sample. Um, now, as I mentioned, our two guest speakers today will talk much more about um, OmniMet gut performance outside the lab, but I'd just like to briefly mention that uh, we conducted two independent field tests, one of which was a true at-home collection test with 30 undergraduate students, um, the other being a really unique um, study design that was collected in the clinic where 16 individuals um, gave both flash frozen and, at the same time, OmniMet gut samples, such that the biochemical signatures between groups of individuals could be assessed in both sample types to make sure that we could get the same answer whether we use flash frozen or OmniMet gut. So um, before I hand it over to our guest speakers, I'd just like to briefly summarize what I've told you. Um, I hope I've convinced you that we have validated the performance of OmniMet gut for global metabolomics and targeted quantification of short-chain fatty acids um, from fecal samples collected at home. These samples are stabilized at room temperature for multiple days with no loss of compound coverage or precision relative to flash frozen samples. And these samples accurately reflect an individual's, a donor's, an individual's metabolomic fingerprint in both lab tests and in field tests, as you will see. Um, and finally, this new sample type is fully integrated into Metabolon's high-throughput workflows. We believe that OmniMet gut will be an enabling technology for metabolomic studies of the gut microbiome, allowing researchers to achieve higher statistical power with more donors, reach a wider range of study populations and geographies, and ultimately generate more powerful insight into how the microbiome affects human health. And now I hand it over to Dr. Hurrigan. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to talk today. I'm a pediatric GI physician and the Vice Chair of Research at Anova Children's Hospital in Northern Virginia. I want to give you a little background on my research, the role of metabolomics, and my work with Metabolon um, in trialing the OmniMet gut collection kit. As many of you know, our gut microbiome undergoes rapid and dynamic development from birth over the first few years of life to reach a relatively steady state by early childhood. Many factors during these first few years of life influence this development. We believe that there's this critical window in early life where changes in the microbiome development influence immune and metabolic development and homeostasis, and this can impact health later in life. Our current research is focused on microbiome changes during this critical time period and consequent health outcomes. We have several large longitudinal childhood microbiome studies here at ANOVA. Our first set of studies are examining microbiome and metabolome signatures prior to disease development. We have a large NICHD-funded study examining the impact of peripartum and early childhood antibiotics 
on the microbiome and subsequent development of obesity. We are also examining the microbiome of vulnerable infants who spent time in the neonatal intensive care unit and following them through early childhood to examine how events in the NICU impact the microbiome and health outcomes. Both of these studies necess necessitate thousands of stool samples being collected longitudinally with home collections. Our second set of studies involve manipulating the microbiome to improve childhood health. We are conducting a large randomized controlled trial in cesarean section delivered infants of a process of vaginal feeding, where infants are wiped down with their mother's vaginal flora, which they are missing in a cesarean section birth. Um, we're examining whether this procedure is effective in reducing childhood obesity, which is associated with cesarean section delivery. We also have trials on pediatric fecal transplants and long-term impacts on microbiome and metabolome. Um, once again, these longitudinal studies involve many samples being collected at home for microbiome analysis. Um, when we're looking at the microbiome, this is very feasible. However, it is much more challenging when examining the metabolome. Um, examining the metabolome in microbiome studies, as many people have already pointed out, is essential, and we've moved beyond just wanting to know who is there, and we want in-depth information on what they are doing. Metabolomics also allow, allows us to assess the function of the microbiome and also can have a role for therapeutic strategies and biomarker discovery. The current gold standard, as we have heard, um, is flash freezing stool samples, um, but this poses many challenges in large longitudinal studies such as ours, including being very inconvenient for families and prohibitively expensive. Moreover, in the times of the current COVID-19 pandemic, in-person research visits uh, to collect samples are much less feasible. Therefore, we were happy to work with Metabolon to trial the OmniMet gut ambient temperature collection kit in our childhood population. We collected stools from 16 infants who were already enrolled in one of our longitudinal studies. Um, we, uh, from, we collected a stool from their diaper uh, at two different time points, approximately three weeks apart. The stool was divided into two aliquots, one flash frozen at minus 80 as the current gold standard, and the second stored in the OmniMet collection kit. Um, and then the metabolomic analysis was compared. Um, I will just briefly show you some of the results. Um, so um, 1,013 metabolites were shared between the two collection methods. And when hierarchical clustering were, uh, was performed, um, at, um, which is shown in this slide, um, you can see that the frozen samples that are in blue and the OmniMet gut collection samples in orange, um, really, this diagram really shows that the samples from the same individual at a given time point clustered close together and they were not clustering by collection method. We then compared repeat samples in the same individual over time separately for the frozen and the OmniMet gut collection. This figure shows the number of metabolites in each biochemical class that significantly increase, which are the solid bars going up, um, or decrease, which are the hatch bars going down, at time point two relative to time point one, with frozen samples in blue and um, the uh, ambient temperature collection in orange. As you can see, the pattern across biochemical classes are very similar for both collections. Overall, these results show for our samples in um, childhood that the OmniMet gut collection kit yielded comparable results to flash freezing in terms of the identity and abundance of detected biochemicals, the distinct, bio, uh, the distinct metabolic profile of subjects, and also the biochemical signature of microbiome development, microbiome development over time. For me, these were exciting results that will impact our research as these ambient collection kits will allow us to sample from metabolomics from home, along with ongoing microbiome samples to allow for better assessment of functionality. In addition, this may reduce the need for expensive frozen shipping from home on, and also inexpensive in-person research visits. I want to say a huge thank you to all our team working on our project to improve childhood health outcomes and also to our funders. Thank you. Okay, hello, uh, my name's Tom Schmidt. Uh, Thanks for the invitation to participate on this panel. Um, and I'd like to start by saying that the overarching goal of my research group is to engineer, is to know enough about the microbiome 
uh, in the human gut that we can use ecological principles and engineer it, engineer the metabolites uh, that are produced. Um, I always like to start out with this slide on this uh, colorized uh, scanning electron micrograph of microbes from the human gut. It shows a large diversity of uh, bacteria that are present. And interestingly, in this case, uh, this consortium of bacteria is assembled on top of a piece of dietary fiber. It's really fiber that fuels the uh, uh, gut microbiome and is responsible for uh, eventually that collection of uh, metabolites uh, that are made. So what I'd like to do in this presentation today is to uh, highlight three points and give you a little bit of background information on each. Uh, the first one is that these metabolites that we're interested in, uh, in the, uh, that are produced by gut microbes, that those microbes are really fueled by dietary fiber. And by definition, that's uh, uh, largely plant material that's not digested by the human host, but it makes it down to the large intestine where microbes are able to uh, digest it. Um, they produce a number of met metabolites and in addition to producing more of themselves. Uh, the second point is that we don't eat enough fiber. Uh, uh, the, ever since the Industrial Revolution, uh, when processed food was introduced into our diet, um, we uh, don't consume enough by several guidelines. And so part of the research we're doing is asking whether we can fill that gap with uh, dietary fiber supplements uh, or prebiotics. And then ultimately, how do we measure the impact of prebiotics? So some of our previous speakers have mentioned the use of nucleic acid-based methods but of course, it's the metabolites that we are really interested in. That's what we want to engineer. Um, and here was a paper that had a large influence on, on my thinking. It's from 2009, so a few, a few years ago now. But in this article, they did a metabolomic analysis of, of uh, blood, uh, comparing the blood of uh, germ-free mice to mice that had a conventional microbiome. And what they were looking for were, again, dietary fibers that made it to the gut, were metabolized by any of a number of gut microbes and, and diffused into the bloodstream. They might diffuse into the liver and be, and be processed, but they really were looking at this uh, metabolites in the blood and comparing it from the germ-free mice to um, uh, conventionally colonized mice. And they found hundreds of metabolites in the blood that were attributed to the gut microbiome. That, that had a huge impact on, uh, on me and convinced me to uh, focus my research on uh, these gut microbes. So uh, here, here's a picture of a healthy diet um, uh, and made up of complex carbohydrates. And um, you know, you might ask, well, how many of these uh, complex carbohydrates are we capable of digesting and how many do we require our gut microbes to digest? So here's another picture of those complex carbohydrates uh, using IUPAC uh, designations for different kinds of uh, monomers uh, and linkages between them. A uh, picture of the gut in the middle here. But here's a, these are the, uh, complex carbohydrates that are in our diet. So you might ask, what, what, how many of these can be broken down by human enzymes and how many require uh, enzymes from microbes in the gut? And the answer is, is pretty astonishing. It's really only uh, some starches and sucrose that we can degrade. Everything else that you see on this slide, including human milk uh, oligosaccharides, require the activity of uh, microbes in the gut. So again, if we're going to try to modify uh, the production of metabolites, we need to think about not only what uh, uh, compounds we're feeding to them, but also which microbes are there. Um, and here's this one uh, figure from a, a few years ago, but the picture hasn't changed, suggesting that um, we are in general not consuming a, enough uh, dietary fiber, uh, at least in the U.S. So 
here's the daily uh, dose of dietary fiber. Uh, the light gray bars are what is recommended uh, by the FDA. The black bars are what is actually consumed, uh, both for males and females, uh, uh, recommended and actually consumed. And as you can see, for most of us, we're consuming about half of the amount of uh, dietary fiber that is recommended. So again, that means to me that we're not fueling the gut microbiome and may and likely are not getting the metabolites from the gut microbiome that uh, we have evolved to expect. Um, there are lots of uh, metabolites uh, made by the human microbiota. Uh, Michael Fishbach and, uh, at the University of California and others are uh, characterizing those metabolites. Um, we, we started out uh, looking at one of the short chain fatty acids, the butyric acid, uh, and uh, we began looking at butyric acid to see if we could engineer the microbiome to make uh, butyric acid or more of it. Um, we need butyric acid to be healthy um, and we don't make it. We're, we're utterly dependent on microbes to produce uh, butyric acid in our uh, GI microbiome. Um, it is the preferred energy source for mitochondria lining the colon, and uh, studies have shown both in mice and humans that um, providing butyrate uh, gives a healthier, uh, tight junction between cells and decreases inflammation. Uh, good studies associate it with a decreased likelihood of colon cancer. Through glucagon-like protein, it regulates satiety, uh, lets, lets you know after you've eaten uh, that, that you have uh, a sense of fullness, um, and in, um, it reduces the incidence and severity of graft versus host disease, one of the projects that I'm working on uh, in, in particular. So, um, how do, we, uh, how do we answer this question? Can fermentation in the gut microbiome be enhanced by supplementing uh, diets with dietary fiber? Well, I'm at a university and uh, was, had the opportunity to teach an introductory biology course and thought, wow, what a, what a great uh, potential group of uh, participants. And so we have um, uh, a, a, an approved study, an IRB approved study, uh, and most of the students in the course are delighted to uh, participate in the course to see if we can uh, modify their uh, engineer their gut microbiome. Here's the design of those experiments uh, that we've run now and about 700 people have participated. So in week one, when they start the study, each person collects four samples. Um, we use those samples to measure pH, uh, microbial community analysis. We take samples for uh, measuring hydrogen and methane in the breath, uh, again, exclusively uh, ferment, uh, products of microbial uh, metabolism. We measure short chain fatty acids and uh, with, in collaboration with Metabolon and DNA Genotech, we have tested uh, the capacity for students to also collect fecal samples to look at other metabolites. Um, the results I'm going to show you today are just for the uh, butyrate, but it emphasizes the point. So again, week one before any uh, dietary supplementation, people collect four samples. During a transition week, no samples are collected. And then uh, in the following week, when they're on a full dose of a fiber supplement, four additional samples are uh, taken. And, and typically our comparison is between the average of these four samples to the average of these four samples to determine if a particular supplement influences any one of these characteristics. Uh, and you know, despite the variation in diet from undergraduates, we didn't try to control anything that they ate or drank uh, during the course of this uh, study. In the very first semester, we saw that a significant increase in concentrations of fecal butyrate. So the blue dashed line is the concentration in week one. The red dashed line is the concentration of uh, butyrate in the feces during week three. 
um, each of these points is an individual person. So here, here was one participant, their average during week one and the average during week three. And um, again, as a group, the population changed uh, and it changed with statistical significance. But look at the variation between individuals. Here are three individuals who all arrived at the study with approximately similar, with similar concentrations of butyrate. Almost no response in this individual here, a dramatic response here, and something intermediate here. So while uh, the, there is an overall response, we noted that the variable response, and we hypothesized that this variation that we're seeing here is due to differences in the composition of the microbiome and gases in the environment of the microbiome. Um, and uh, I'd like to tell you more about that if I had time, but uh, I think I'll uh, uh, j just keep uh, uh, moving on here. And when I've shown these, presented these results, people often ask, they say, hey, listen, if it's butyrate that you're after, why don't you just administer butyrate? And uh, the point is, is that if we're stimulating fermentation uh, in the gut microbiome, which we are, we're not just stimulating the production of short chain fatty acids, but we're, we're stimulating the production of lots of metabolites and hence, uh, that was the reason for now launching in and looking at, at, at other metabolites. Um, we have a good idea of the organisms uh, and some of the cross-feeding reactions that are underway. We're interested in the pr production of butyrate, but I could list a hundred other metabolites that we believe and now have some evidence are also being modified uh, by this dietary fiber supplementation. So let me just summarize here. So by supplementing diets with fiber, we did increase fermentation in the gut microbiome in a majority of individuals. We know that butyrate was uh, increased and we're now looking at uh, other metabolites. Uh, we found that uh, both for the nucleic acid uh, collection and for the metabolite uh, collection, it was essential to have the capacity for ambient storage. Uh, we were working with a cohort of uh, people who were co collecting samples. And while they, in this case, happened all to be at the University of Michigan, it was uh, not possible to collect samples and freeze them immediately. Um, lots of students are in university housing. Um, yeah, I mean, you can imagine a lot of complications there. Uh, having uh, ambient storage was, was essential. Um, and currently we're working with Metabolon to relate the metabolites to the structure of the microbiome. We have some interesting uh, preliminary results and uh, just uh, de delighted with the direction that we're headed in terms of engineering the microbiome. A great group of people that's uh, behind this work and is also providing funding for the for the human cohort. And I'll just end with this uh, slide to suggest that you take care of your microbial garden and uh, eat more fiber. So I'll end there. All right, great. Well, thank you, Dr. Schmidt. Um, so with that, we'll transition over to the, uh, the Q&A portion of the webinar. And during the course of, the, of the, all the presentations, which were fantastic, thank you to, to all the presenters, uh, we've received a number of questions, so that's great. So I'll, I'll go through and see, uh, we'll do our best to try and answer all of them. I've seen a number of questions that have come in talking about sample type what type of uh, uh, sample matrix are supported? Is it just limited to feces? Uh, is it limited to just human or primate or rats? Um, Heloise, is that something that you wanna uh, take on? Sure, uh, that's very exciting to see that there's lots of other sample types that people are interested in. Uh, for the time being, this specific product, OmniMet Gut, is only for, intended for use with uh, human feces. That's what it's being validated for. 
Um, so any other uses of the kit would be considered uh, off-label and we at this time would not be able to uh, really provide additional support. Uh, but anybody who's interested in, you know, sal uh, saliva, for example, oral, urine, anything like that, uh, because we do have other products on the microbiome space, we are looking to transition that to potentially new products for metabolomics. So reach out to DNA Genotech. We'd love to hear um, what people are looking for next. Great, thanks. Uh, along those same lines, we, we've had a couple of other questions as well around um, how much. So how much sample is needed for metabolomics? Is it the whole tube? Is it half the tube? Is it even less than that? And then in addition, they ask specifically about, you know, they'll aliquot samples into tubes for long-term storage and the question specifically about how many aliquots are recommended. And, um, Lisa, if that's something that you want to uh, go ahead and take, I think. Yes, definitely. Um, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I can't really answer um, very specifically because it all depends on the particular methodology that's going to be used for metabolomic analysis. Um, and, um, you know, if you're planning an NMR study, then the sensitivity of that, for example, is much lower. And also depending on how many separate assays you want to run. Um, as I mentioned, here at Metabolon, we run four different methods for metabolomics, but Another group might be running fewer than that, um, but might be using a less sensitive mass spectrometer. So basically, um, before uh, it would really be ideal for um, any investigator to really consult with the metabolomics provider before doing the sample collection, and certainly before aliquoting the samples, um, and to make sure that the samples are, are kept as ideal as possible for the specific application. All right, great, thank you. Uh, another question we've seen a couple of different times in, in a variety of ways is specifically about uh, collection of the sample and whether or not the scenario is one where the individual donors are sending that directly into, in this case, Metabolon or into the, the core lab. Um, Lisa, and I'll leave that to, to either of you to, to address that. Yeah, I, I really want to actually address this one, so thank you for, for asking it because I think my slide that talked about this might have been a little oversimplified um, for the sake of um, giving a broad overview. But yeah, we're not um, asking individual donors to send their samples directly to Metabolon. Again, another, um, another provider might be set up differently, but for us, we will work with the investigators who are doing the study design um, and we'll um, give that, that investigator everything that they, all the information that they need to be able to have their donors collect the samples and then gather up those samples at the client's local facility um, and then ship them to us as a batch, just like they would with any other type of sample, like whether it be plasma or cells. And we have a detailed sample submission guide that goes through all of that in detail. So no, we definitely do not want individual donor samples coming through us to, in the regular mail. Um, that wouldn't really be uh, logistically feasible or consistent with a good study. Great, thanks. Um, so we have one question um, about the comparison to standard flash freezing. Um, the OmniMet gut and standard flash freeze comparisons for stability were impressive, uh, largely similar, but there were, uh, were there any metabolites or metabolite families that just didn't show that same level of reliability uh, or reliable stability? Uh, and also, this is uh, a specific reference to uh, Dr. Horgan's data on freezing versus the OmniMet gut method. Uh, they noticed a very consistent trend, albeit small, uh, where the OmniMet gut samples had uh, more metabolites increased and fewer metabolites decreased when compared to uh, flash freezing across many families. Uh, so that, that, uh, I don't know if that's something uh, Lisa or Dr. Horgan would, either of you would like to uh, take on a, an attempt at an answer at that. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I guess I'll I'll go back to the first question first about the different classes of metabolites. So um, I think I did share a, a quick slide on that where uh, we saw that the peptides were the least well-behaved class. We're putting those into um, into um, OmniMet tubes, even for you know a couple of minutes, did lead to a, a loss of correlation. Um, there were a couple dozen peptides that were detected in this study, and you know while we would have preferred to have all the metabolites be perfectly correlated, the peptides were somewhat of less concern to us because 
we don't tend to rely on those as heavily for interpretation. They can come from food, from dead cells in the, you know, from the gut lining, um, from dead bacteria. So we are, um, you know, I think it would be interesting to to figure out why it is that the peptides were being lost, whether it was a um, ongoing protease activity in the in the stool or mechanical disruption within the tube. But you know that that is the data that we have, and we would sort of advise caution with with peptide data from feces, probably with any sample collection methodology, but in particular with with this one. Mm -hmm. So if you're planning to do proteomics, this is probably not. It's probably not the device that you want to use. Um, uh, uh, regarding the OmniMed samples uh, from the um, clinical collection, uh, we are currently digging into that data more now to pinpoint exactly which biochemicals may have been behaving differently uh, between the two studies. Um, I think that's a really important question to address, but we're certainly encouraged to, to see that most of the trends and actually most many of the individual biochemicals and types of biochemicals that change in the same direction were changed in the same direction across both sample sets. Dr. Horgan, do you have anything to, to add to that? Or um, no, I with Lisa. I mean, the overall trends were very similar to each other, in which um, pathways significantly changed. You know, so we can see that we're really maintaining that biological signature. Um, but as Lisa mentioned, we do want to dig further into those individual um, individual metabolites to see if we're picking up any signals where the tubes are behaving differently. And we're in the process of that now. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, here's another uh, logistical question around the use of the um, on your gut. What is the maximum length of days? The collected sample can be stored at room temperature until the downstream assays are completed. Yep, happy to answer that one. So just to recap every all the data that you saw today, um, DNA Genentech is supporting seven days of ambient temperature stability with this product. Um, so that's based on the validation data. That is the interpretation we made. Um, we have all of that beautiful data to show that in the white paper that Lisa talked about uh, in her part of the presentation. So we encourage anybody to consult that. Um, we know that some people will feel comfortable with uh, potentially shorter amounts of days. Uh, we see that with our uh, microbiome products as well. Um, so we expect that uh, you know different facilities and groups will potentially do additional testing. And uh, yes, at the end of the day, it's up to you uh, how many of those seven days you potentially want to use based on what the data tells you. Um, I also saw there was a question on, on storage. So um, just it kind of flows into that. After those seven days, we do recommend that you put your samples at minus 80. That is the standard within the space of metabolomics, so that's what we expect you to do. If you can get your samples in the minus 80 before that seven days is up, that's more fantastic. Um, that just ensures your data is going to be the best it can be. Um, and we have a document to better explain storage recommendations uh, if you're considering the use of the product. Great. Thanks, Eloise. Um, here's a question that came in, uh, and since it mentions butyrate specifically, uh, this might be a question for, for you, Dr. Schmidt, but uh, can microbial composition in a fecal sample be directly correlated with metabolites? Suppose if we know the butyrate produces in, in a sample, can we say if an individual is good or a bad butyrate producer? Yeah, we'd really like to be able to do that for obvious reasons. Um, but the challenge is, is that there are, you know, at least a dozen prominent species in the gut microbiome that make butyrate. And so, um, it's, it's, so that, com that complicates the picture. And I doubt it's going to typically be a one-to-one -one correlation between uh, particular butyrogen and the butyrate concentrations. So we're, we're looking more to metagenomics and trying to uh, quantify the number of uh, genes involved in the pathway, sort of a summation of butyrate producers. I think that's the more likely relationship to butyrate. Great. All right, thanks. Um, here's a question. I, I think we touched on this, but I do think it's important to make sure it's clear. Um, and this might be something that uh, you can specifically address, Heloise. Can this kit stabilize DNA as well as metabolites? Basically, can we subsample from a single, single tube and use a single sample for multiple analysis? 
we expected that question uh, the second we thought about making this product and being a DNA company, obviously the first thing we did was go and test the DNA that was coming out of these tubes. Uh, what we found was that uh, DNA integrity uh, was immediately affected by introducing samples into this device. Uh, and based on some additional data that we generated internally, we would not recommend uh, sampling DNA from this particular device. Um, we do have the OmniGene device, which is perfectly suited for that and preserves the microbial DNA snapshot perfectly. So what we recommend is that you uh, sample your, uh, your species both with the OmniGene and the OmniMet side by side. That way you get the very best for both, uh, for both data. Right. All right, great, thank you. Uh, so we have a question here specifically uh, about short-chain fatty acid. Um, how well does the Global Metabolon platform quantify short-chain fatty acid? And I guess that's probably a good question for you, Lisa. Sure, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So um, the, the Global Platform at Metabolon is a, is a very large library with lots of biochemicals, but short-chain fatty acids are actually a rare example of a type of biochemical that's not very well suited to that platform, and that's because they're volatile and um, just <clears throat> as they just evaporate during the sample preparation. That's been optimized for more broad uh, look at the entire metabolome, um, and so um, certainly, certainly the um, with regard to the quantitation aspect, um, the it is everything about the global platform is relative quantitation. Uh, but also the sensitivity of and the ability of Metabolon's platform to detect short-chain fatty acids, again, on the global side, um, is not ideal. It's not optimized, uh, which is exactly why we felt it was really important to validate Omnimet for both global metabolomics, of course, but also for the targeted short-chain fatty acid um, methodology that, um, number one, is fully quantitative, and number two is optimized specifically for detection of those volatile metabolites. And so we really expect that a lot of clients will uh, be interested and benefit from um, doing both um, types of assay with us, which they can do from a single tube. Great, all right, thank you. Uh, so we have a, a kind of a follow-up, I think, to an earlier question as it relates to uh, you know, some of the logistics. So just to clarify, uh, the samples would be sent to Metabolon in the original collection tubes, uh, specifically the Omnipen um, gut. Uh, they wouldn't have to be transferred to barcoded tubes that you provide. I guess that's uh, that sounds like a Metabolon specific question. Uh, so I think Lisa, maybe that is, for you. That's a great question, and, and I promise it came from the audience. We didn't precede that one, but it was, it's really a good question. So the, one of the great things about the Omnipen tubes is that they are already barcoded, and that. Uh, format of barcode works with our um, sample inventory system. So we actually would strongly encourage you to send the whole tube in to us um, and kind of let us do the downstream handling um, rather than aliquoting it or using any other types of tube. Um, certainly not something that we would ask you to do. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, so going back through uh, some of the ones that we uh, may have missed at the beginning, there's a specific question about fecal calprotectin and wanting to know, uh, did you test fecal calprotectin with the OmniMet kit? Uh, I'm not sure who might be best positioned to address that, but I'm thinking either have a weeds or Lisa. Uh, yeah, it wasn't one of the assays um, that we included in that, um, but I think people might um, potentially see, and I don't know if it's something that Part of Sorry, Heloise, I had lost audio, so but it sounded like you were able to address that. Uh, yeah, I was just saying it wasn't part of our original testing for this device, and I didn't want know if Lisa had any additional comments to say if it's something that is typically seen on the metabolome platform. No, no, calprotectin, I believe, is a protein analyte, so we do not, um, we don't detect that. Yeah. All right, great, thank you. Uh, let's see, still some more questions here. Um, 
But I think this is a follow up to an earlier question about will the interrogation analysis shed some light on the global pathways uh, getting affected? Um, sure, I guess I, I'll take that one. Can can everybody hear me? We had a little bit of a glitch with the sound. Okay, I'm getting nods. Great. Um, so yes, we do think that um, as Dr. Schmidt has, has talked in detail, uh, short chain fatty acids are some of the key endpoints of gut microbial metabolism, and and they're some of the most well established bioactive metabolic microbiome. And so being able to capture those, as well as all the upstream metabolism that's going on, that it might be you know, known. Um, I think it's a really good inclination to be able to do both. Okay, I think you were breaking up there uh, a little bit, Lisa, so I don't know if um, we can address um, that. Should I try to say it again? Could everybody, could everybody nod at Metabolon hear me? Yes, I'm getting nods. That's better. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. sorry. That's okay. It might have just been the way I was talking. Um, do you want to do the next question, Kenny? Uh, yes. Let me go here, here and see what we've got next. So this so is a question is specifically, specifically about the stabilizer in the amino gut. gut. Just ask that. Just asking asking essentially, as an acid or organic paste. So maybe a question for uh, Heloise. Do you want to address that one about that? All right. Yes. Um, so the um, the composition of the chemistry per se is a trade secret of DNA genetics, so we wouldn't uh, reveal everything in there. Um, but just as a note, uh, we can confirm that it does uh, contain the major solvent is uh, ethanol. We would have to declare that in our MSDS anyways. Um, so. All right, great, thank, thank you. you. Um, More, and I guess there's one for you specifically, Dr. Schmidt. It's it's asking about um, consuming 40 grams of recommended fiber intake, whether that's uncomfortable to humans, and if that's actually one of the reasons for the reduced intake of fiber. Oh, I think you're muted, Dr. Schmidt. Uh, thanks. Uh, yep, 40 grams seems like a lot. It's actually uh, a few tablespoons, so it, it's not a lot. Um, uh, people in general don't uh, uh, have problems with that, although uh, with some fiber supplements they do, like inulin, uh, very common fiber that is uh, used, and it's fermented so rapidly that it uh, uh, produces gas in the upper GI tract, and I think that's the reason that it's uncomfortable, uh, that, that supplement is un uncomfortable to some people. But in general, 40 grams is... Uh, reasonable to get with a plant-rich diet. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, thanks. So we are at 12.15, um, and I think we've addressed most of the questions. Um, so I just want to, again, on behalf of DNA Genotech uh, and Metabolon, thank you for attending. Uh, a big special thank you to the presenters today. And we will be following up uh, with the recorded version of the webinar, so be on the lookout for that correspondence. And again, thank you to all for attending.